It's a distinct honor to be here amongst you uh, to share uh, my perspective on, on a couple of issues. I, I would like to start with sharing with you uh, the concerns and the challenges and the opportunities of global food security from a perspective of an academic and perhaps uh, a native of Africa who has deep-rooted concern about uh, some of these issues. And also to share with you that the agenda of global food security is not only a concern about the poor and the hungry in developing countries, although that is primarily what drives many of us. But I think as some of you, as many of us have um, shared about this in the discussions from yesterday, and that sustainably feeding a growing world population is likely to be an agenda of immense concern for all of us uh, as human beings. Uh, and then uh, just to provide an example on the power of science and technology and what it would do in, in solving a major problem in uh, uh, food security in developing countries, I'll share with you the work my colleagues and I have been working on uh, on this parasitic weed, which we have dubbed uh, probably the greatest biological constraint in crop production in, in African food systems. I think um, eradicating hunger, malnutrition, and poverty uh, from the face of the earth uh, needs to be humanity's foremost challenge in the 21st century. When you look around uh, the map of the world, and that except for North America, Australia, Western Europe, and maybe Japan and South Korea, there isn't a place in the world where humanity continues to see, a significant portion of humanity continues to suffer from um, these ills. And so when you look at uh, the resources that we have around the world, the immense knowledge that are in our hands, it really is not a good testimonial that we continue to fight these perennial evils of humanity continually. Uh, as you know, uh, the headlines are, I think by 2011, uh, the population of the world is said to have reached 7 billion, and the projections are by 2050 or so, we will reach about 9.5 billion people on this planet. And as we've heard yesterday, proportionally then, that calculates to some 37, 40% proportional commensurate seed um, and food production uh, uh, increases. Um, but, but at the same time, as many of you know, um, that the diets of people are increasingly changing as a result of increases in income around the world. Um, many more people are beginning to afford food in their own communities, and, the, uh, and that would mean, particularly in areas where the emerging economies of the population of middle income is increasing, that the diets of those people are moving from the basic starch and carbohydrate diet to the more protein-based diet, suggesting perhaps that we will be needing to produce more grain to pass through the guts of livestock and poultry so that we are able to provide the protein needs that are emerging. So added on that, uh, some suggest that that would add an additional 30, 40 percent uh, food production supply need that would need to be uh, provided. And, and some indicate that that is likely to accelerate, and if we don't take care of some of the other problems that we had about food loss and food waste, uh, we may have to double our food production increases in the next uh, few decades. And that is, is, is a huge challenge because in the past, we have increased or kept in, in pace with population growth in increasing food supply through two means. Uh, through one is the horizontal, uh, uh, the, the vertical, seed inc uh, vertical production increase through intensive agriculture. And think about a, a year ago, I was invited to uh, address an organic food um, uh, conference in Italy, and so I asked, 
The photographer at Purdue, we have a very talented photographer in the College of Agriculture, and I said, Tom, could you go out and sh shoot for me a photograph of a 250 bushel cornfield? And he went out and got me this incredibly beautiful uh, corn and soybean field. And so where technology had been accessed, the science of genetics and chemistry and biology have been utilized in the developed world. This is a kind of food production system that have increased the supply of food. The other alternative, of course, is in horizontal increase through shifting cultivation where a farmer would abandon a field that had been uh, contaminated by striga or uh, the uh, soils have been eroded and gradually reaching out to the hills or the mountains of many of our uh, Asian and African countries where with population increase, ab abandon a piece of land that is tired and not usable and moving to new era of land. Increasing, of course, the larger expansion in Amazonia and other places where deforestation and, and um, bringing more land into production have provided. And so in many of these places, however, in developing countries, particularly in Africa, you don't see any sign of science and technology having made a difference hugely in their lives. And so in, in, in many of these places, the science of genetics, the science of chemistry that we talked about yesterday and science of biology that have transformally, transformally changed agriculture and lives of people in the developed world have not touched the lives of these people. So these are the two ways in which we have increased food production anyway. But moving forward, we're facing a lot of challenges. Um, and this is a supply of food for a family and uh, storage systems and so on are only able to handle this because they're tightly kept in their own families and so on. But I've shown you those two contrasting pictures, one from North America and, and, and one from, from Africa. What we have learned is both of these production systems have significant carbon footprints. And the picture that I showed you um, in from North America may have more than the recommended fertilizers and pesticides, insecticide, possibly. But the field that I showed you from Africa, you know, 100 years past the discovery of ammonia, and 70 and 100 years since the discovery of genetics, and the transformative agricultural revolution that a hybrid vigor had brought to Western Europe and North America. Fertilizer use and use of genetics in Africa is very limited, and it averages about 10 kilograms per hectare today, as it did since you know, at the beginning of Africa's independence. In the developed world, as I said, in many areas, excessive use of those uh, potentially uh, game-changing chemicals uh, has also brought up those kinds of concerns. And so agriculture, moving forward, not only has a challenge of feeding a growing world population, as many of us agree, it has a challenge of finding a way to sustainably, continually feed a growing world population. And that is going to require a lot more knowledge, a lot more technology than what is available. Because agriculture also faces many, many more challenges. We've got the population growth on one hand and the increase in production, in production supplies. Each one of these are major challenges. Each one of these are attackable. But the population growth uh, has got, is encumbered with a lot of issues of religious, uh, cultural, social issues that it is very much a slow process even though we need to continue to target it, it's likely to take a lot more time. The production targets are easily achievable, but we need to be able to handle some of these, one, existing challenges that are getting to be bigger and bigger, 
and the emerging grand challenges that are coming to us. I know I don't have time to get into detail in a lot of this, but let me enumerate them for you. In the production systems that we have had, as I already mentioned, we are beginning to recognize the ecological concerns that are, bringing up, uh, that are coming at us. The ecological concerns with operating farms without science and technology and degrading the environment as it happens in developing countries. The ecological concerns also that are coming in the developed agriculture and developed economies because of the need for judicious use of these incredibly powerful resources that have been given. And so the, the fragility of our ecosystem is a concern and finding a ways to continually produce more food with judicious use of inputs and new, may require new technologies like precision agriculture in the developed world may be providing conventionally available technologies to the developing countries. The other major concern that we have is around the world, land is getting to be more and more limited. That it is said that nearly maybe some 12% more arable land can be brought to cultivation without deforestation. And many of these lands are available in countries where science and technology has not penetrated uh, uh, their, their, their communities, such as Africa, for example. And so with these resources, the, the need to potentially and carefully and judiciously exploiting these natural resources in areas where they remain is going to be very important. And again, the need for more investment in science and technology in those areas and, and perhaps sharing of knowledge from around the world. And, and the other issue is our food systems in general, uh, in terms of food losses and food waste, food losses primarily in, in developing countries where the unavailability of markets and lack of transportation and infrastructure limits farmers who struggle to produce some, particularly in perishable fruits and vegetables and also in grains, from not having the right market and losing it because they neither have the storage and processing and so on facilities as well as not having a market that would add value and, and take advantage of that for the farmers in providing them with the necessary incentive to exploit that. Along in, inside the food system as well, we've got food quality issues, food uh, uh, safety issues, and we also have issues of storage and processing and lack of cooling, drying, freezing, and being able to transport food to the markets and around the world. And many of these are addressed through science and technology that is yet to penetrate many of these people in developing countries, particularly in the larger context, the continent of Africa. And nutrition and health is, is an issue. An issue in that because in many of these poor developing countries, the opportunity to diversify their diets are limited. And when you look back in the history of modern agriculture, where our investments have been are in the commodities that are globally marketed to be processed in the value chain and supply systems that have already established and not the traditionally more useful, nutritionally, nutritionally rich uh, 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 commodities that are available in many of these local economies have not been seen the sign of science and technology and research has not been invested in them. And so we're very limited uh, in, in, in that area as well. So there are these emerging uh, uh, prob I mean, uh, existing problems that have gotten to be uh, bigger and bigger uh, all the time. And at the same time, there are also issues of these emerging grand challenges. As you know, the climate agenda that is going to be affecting agriculture in many, many ways, uh, as many of you would know. And the other issue is the, the grand challenge of water. Now, water is getting to be a huge problem because of the fact that a lot of the fresh water around the world, some 70% of the fresh water is used in agriculture and only some 25, 30% in industrial and, and home use. Ironically, the part of the world that have exploited its natural resources, 
exploited its science and technology, the ones that have supplied more of the food for humanity are the areas in which the water pressure is being felt because the areas of the world that have developed their agriculture have used up in some sectors of their communities more water and therefore water is getting to be a pressing need around the world. The same can be said about energy even though with uh, current fracking technologies and so on, some, you know, all of our attentions are moving away from energy a little bit, but energy is an important ingredient in, in agriculture in so many ways. And the energy use around the world is also uneven. Areas of the world with the smallest population, Western Europe and North America, with the powers of the science and technology they have, have used a lot more of the energy supplies available. And as opportunities are expanding to the BRICS in Asia, in, in India, in China, in Brazil, in some of these other places, and potentially to the other uh, emerging economies around the world, energy use is going to increase in some of these areas. But even at the current rate, uh, the projection is every, you know, the, there is 2% increase in energy demand. And so in some 37, 40 years or so, the demand for energy doubles. And the, the, the opportunity that developing countries have to transform their, their agriculture and their economy in the short term is going to be limited, but if, unless attention is diverted to that, maybe potentially to alternative energy that is likely to take more time, but finding ways to exploit energy sources around many of the geographies in developing countries is going to be needed. And the other, of course, is the global trade, the, the regulations around it, and the, and the opportunities are limited in developing countries, both in the infrastructure and the human capacity, institutional capacity that exist in many of these places, again, limiting their opportunity to engage in the global economy. So these are strong, major headwinds in, in agriculture, but if I may generalize, the greater solutions and opportunities for us in, in addressing many of these problems remain through science and technology and opportunities that we have there. And so anything that we could do as human, as human, as society around the world uh, to make sure that these pockets of humanity that have not yet benefited from science and technology uh, that get that opportunity is going to be essential to all of us. So the narrative is that we've got a rapidly growing world population and the growing demand because of the demand on food, for producing food, feed, fiber, and fuel uh, on the same planet uh, is putting this uh, huge pressure. And so we have this scenario of that needs to be debated or, 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 or discussed in, in much more nuance, uh, nuance is the finite resources, infinite demands that we're, we're creating, and the aspirations that we, we need to have for sustainable food supply. But as I said, in general, science, technology, innovation, and markets remain to be the key levers for our new paradigm for sustainable development. With that, I would shift gears and talk a little bit about the work that I had been working on, on an important food crop in developing countries, particularly Africa. Sorghum is originated in Africa with a lot of diversity, a lot of potential to improve, and yet there has not been significant, particularly private sector investment in this crop. And the other, the problem that I would address here would be the uh, parasitic weed striga. Um, the, the impact from this parasite is huge. Billions of dollars are estimated. And uh, want to share with you a fascinating biology of the parasite and the host plant. And this parasite, and this is a single parasite plant that produces up to over 100,000 seed every single plant. And that seed is dumped into the soil on an annual basis. And in a vigorous plant, as much as 500,000 seed per plant is produced. And the seed has long viability. If conditions are not right, it would continue to sit in the ground and continually damage uh, 
more uh, the crop for over a long period of time. There are a number of species, uh, but the two that are particularly important are the species Asiatica and for uh, Hermontica in Africa. There are requirements for uh, the parasite to germinate. Uh, there are con dormancy periods, conditioning, and germination, which I would uh, very quickly go through uh, that. So when before I started this project, uh, as of, after I became a faculty member at Purdue University, I have worked on this as a member of the International Agricultural Research System, working for ICRISAT for about five years. And the avenue that was available for us at the time is in a classical approach for selecting for resistance, you grow out uh, your varieties in the field and try to see how many of them are not damaged. Uh, with a parasite with zillions of seeds on the ground and conditions for opportunities for emergence right, it is very difficult to find very many resistance sources. Secondly, many of the problems occur below ground, and so the ability of a scientist, a field scientist, to select for those is very limited. And so the paradigm we developed was to understand the life cycle of between the parasite and the host and try to find if we can find ways to disrupt that relationship. And if, if you may visualize this, two purple plants here at the parasite and uh, this yellow plant at the sorghum, uh, these seeds would be dumping those thousands of seeds in the soil and that seed would go through a period of dormancy and the period of conditioning before they would germinate. The period for dormancy is about three to six months after the seeds have been collected or, or uh, dumped into the ground. Conditioning is very easy to satisfy in tropical environment because it's warm temperature and some moisture available. So the beginning of the rainy season would just automatically induce uh, the, the conditioning. But what we learn is that after the seeds are conditioned, it requires a chemical signal that is exuded by the host plant to elicit that germination in the, in the weed seed. If the weed seed is in close proximity to that chemical exudate, then it would germinate. If it doesn't, it will revert back to dormancy, and as I said, that seed is, can remain in the soil for a long period of time. But once it germinates, once it germinates, uh, it needs to proceed, and we found out that it requires yet another chemical signal to elicit the hostorial formation that allows it to establish on the host plant. And, and so that is a totally different chemical compound from the first. And so there are a series of these uh, uh, through attachment and penetration. There are also signals that are uh, involved, both of chemical and physical nature, uh, that, that uh, make that possible. And so we developed from this knowledge um, by cr uh, creating this uh, sketch, uh, we developed a hypothesis. And that hypothesis is that if we continue to do classical selection, most of our genetic base is likely to be quantitative, involving many of these steps that I just described. Whereas if we were to develop specific assays to follow each different stage, we could perhaps do this in the laboratory and then the, the basis of the genetics of those are likely to be simply inherited, allowing us to exploit them very easily and select for them easily. And ambitiously also, we thought that if we could uh, uh, separate this out, and this, uh, dissect these components into component parts, we're likely to bring all of this about and pyramid them into a single variety eventually. That was the basis upon which our hypothesis uh, uh, our work started. And so initially, uh, I cooperated with a biochemist, an enzyme chemist that have not worked with any field uh, research before. And uh, uh, we looked with, with the, the postdoc in the lab that started it. I don't know if you see it from the picture. At the end of these root hairs were these dark colored uh, phenolic-like compounds. And so suspected would this be having any role with germination signals. And so we found that uh, uh, we collaborated with a chemist at University of Chicago and identified 
this particular compound called, that we named sorgoleon. And, uh, and so at the time we thought maybe we found the signal that is responsible for resistance to striga. And we found out later we thought we should check with available genetic sources and we evaluated them to find out that while this has activity in germination, it, it was not the particular compound responsible for resistance. Later work both on corn and uh, uh, cowpea, uh, we identified this sorgolactone, and that eventually was responsible for resistance at the germination stage. And so there are other compounds uh, that, are, that are also involved. And so the second stage is, if I may do this quickly, is um, to go through and develop assays, assays that would allow us to look at germination. And here is uh, a particular Striga, I mean, sorghum variety that does not allow germination because it doesn't produce a, the particular compound. And here is a variety that produces a lot of it, and there is striga being germinating all over. And there are other factors, the historical factor, that I would mention in a little bit. And we developed an assay for looking at the hypersensitive reaction similar to a classic hypersensitive response in diseases. And we found, uh, uh, um, uh, we developed an assay for this kind of response that we dubbed incompatible response because that's the kind of response we would get if we uh, put striga on an unhost plant. And uh, we had, uh, this is to show uh, the vascular connection in a susceptible variety and the lack of penetration in, in the resistant variety. Whereas a susceptible variety uh, would grow unaffected by striga would grow like, uh, a striga in a, in, a, in a susceptible variety would grow like this. And so we, we started, we had assigned different students to look for sources of resistance for each one of these mechanisms that we developed. We were able to find germination uh, um, uh, resistance based on the absence or reduced level of low germination stimulant in a number of sorghum varieties as well as in a wild sorghum. The low historial factor resistance we have not been able to find in cultivated sorghum, but we eventually found it in the wild sorghum. The hypersensitive response The hypersensitive response we were able to find in both wild sorghums and cultivated sorghum, and the same for the incompatible response. And then we looked at the genetics of them. As we predicted, we found out many of them were un un in in a simply inherited, uh, and they were able to, we were able to exploit them. We mapped many of them on the genetic map of sorghum, and we've... Uh, um, we looked at the low germination stimulant in a highly saturated map here that I'll speak to in a little bit. And then the quantitative uh, basis of resistance on, based on field reaction, both on Asiatica and Hermontica, we were able to map those as well. And fine mapping uh, with higher resolution, we were able to have a collection of sorghum genotypes and find that they co-segregate for a particular a gene that we were able to, to isolate here. And to put this into practice, uh, we were able to effectively transfer uh, this resistance. Uh, this is uh, the low germination stimulant mechanism. We were able to, here is a sister line that is highly susceptible in a test that we conducted in, in Niger, and here is a sister line that is resistant. And so the first variety we released was in the Sudan, uh, in the early 90s based on this mechanism. Um, and then we were challenged, I think it was the Rockefeller Foundation asked us, with funding asked us if we could put the striga resistant genes in varieties that farmers would normally grow just to change them only by incorporating the single gene. So this student standing in the middle uh, uh, is from Niger. He carefully uh, went through this and established ISO lines with and without the resistance. And we pyramided many of these uh, into a single genotype. And uh, uh, as you could see, the selection we made out of a number of 
populations that we generated, we have some that had all three mechanisms incorporated in them. And here is the first variety we released that had th the three resistant mechanisms embedded with them. And then we, we wanted to enhance or increase the opportunity for adoption of these technologies and package it in a little way, in a little different way that would uh, encourage farmers to adopt them. Uh, for that, we said, if we would put the striga resistant cultivar and encourage the use of nitrogen fertilization and then encourage the water conservation through tide ridges and so on, the water conservation would increase the opportunities for the fertilizer to provide response in a dryland agriculture through a combination of the fertilizer response and the striga resistance, yields would be boosted, and then whether or not the farmer has a striga or not, these technologies would, would be very useful anyway. And so we run a pilot project in a couple of African countries, and, uh, and that has led to, to successful adoption. Here is... Um, uh, a package on the left is a farmer's practice. On the right is uh, the package that we put together. Um, here is, uh, again, in another country where that technology provided dramatic response to, to the farmers. And we worked with the farmers about on-farm seed production because one of the things that I lament about is the lack of seed industry in many developing countries, particularly Africa, because the input industry is extremely important in enhancing agriculture or transforming agriculture, and Africa still suffers from the lack of input supply, both in seeds and, and, and other inputs. Um, and then we, we multiplied uh, the seeds and uh, we cooperated with, uh, this was in the early 90s again, uh, cooperated with um, an NGO, um, uh, World Vision International, we shipped about eight tons of seed that we produced at Purdue University and uh, released them to 12 African countries. And out of those, there were multiple releases of those varieties. Uh, in Sudan, there were three varieties released, one in Niger, three in Ethiopia, and two in Tanzania, and two in Eritrea. And that has uh, have been very effectively used. Uh, in summary, I just briefly went through some 20 years of work uh, on, just to, to share with you, even in Africa, even in many of these situations, science and technology can make a huge difference in the lives of people, systematically developing an over-research program and eventually delivering uh, um, an environment where smallholder farmers can, can benefit from. So how do we feed 9 billion um, by 250? Uh, I don't have any more response that is dissected that I can have in, in the next couple of minutes, but I would say that science, technology, innovation, and the marketplace are the key. Uh, that to be able to do that, you would need an enhanced human and institutional capacity in many developing countries, provide opportunities for gainful employment for global youth, because the alternative has been trouble in, in many places. We need to have an enlightened public-private partnerships. Uh, we need to have an improved governance and democracy in all nations, and peace and stability are key to bring about change in many of these places. These need not, need, need not be aspirations. They need to be targeted and deliberately approached because in the long run, it is really in the best interest of humanity at large to make sure that these corners of the world that have not had the benefit of science and technology get them. Because when they do, they become good citizens and we would be able to continually exploit the incredible resources that nature had provided to us. If we don't do that, we will continually have a divided world, divided with gaps in knowledge and gaps in resources, and that none of us would be better for it. Quickly, um, I think eradicating hunger and malnutrition and poverty is going to require deliberate investment in human and institutional capacity development. Statistically, the opportunities that are available in Africa are immense. Africa's 
agriculture economy is about a third of trillion dollars today, projected to be about a trillion dollars in the next 30 years or so. Uh, Africa has a lot of natural resources and it could be potentially be made available to exploit that. Uh, there are some uh, 34 million hectares of African shared globally traded in, um, uh, in, um, in 2000, uh, I can't read from here. Um, but, but, but land resources that are available, but Africa needs to be serious about it, its own investment. And that in 2003 or so, the CADA agreement, 53, 54 countries got together and wanted to commit 10% of their national budget to agriculture. To date, there are only seven or eight countries that have done that. So I think it requires a combination of investment Africa needs to make, invest its own meager resources, particularly in what I consider a crucial fundamental need, and that is human and institutional capacity development. Eradicating hunger and poverty in many developing countries is going to require that investment in internal capacity. We can send all the technology we, need, we, 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 we want. We can send all the experts we want we want, except unless we have those capacities on the ground to check, improve, and evolve, adjust, modify those technologies, transformative change is not likely to take place in many of these places. So investing in human institutional capacity globally as human beings around the world, and particularly from the leadership of the African countries is going to be extremely important. Uh, thank you very much. Let me take. So let thank. Me, let me take a moment, just a second, uh, just to make a point. It helps me. When when I received the World Food Prize, the World Food Prize Foundation sent me with a photographer to Africa to get some footage for, for the ceremony. And I don't remember this picture was taken. In my home village, and I don't remember when the picture was taken. But I saw this picture, it has become my favorite picture, and I have it posted on the wall of my office. And I wanted to make, because of this, it reminds me that I was one of these children growing up. Through education, I received an opportunity upon which I changed my life and possibly touched some lives. And, and I would like to think that one of these children someday, given the opportunity, they could also be somebody down the road. I just wanted to share that with you. BASF. We create chemistry.